We're grateful today to be here at Book of Acts with the, um, the Christian Motorcycle Association, the chapter here in Brownwood, Riding for the Sun. And uh, I've got a message for all those who ride for the sun today. Is that all right? And it comes from Malachi chapter 4. Last prophecy in the Old Testament. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. I want you to drop down with me to verse 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What day is that talking about? It's talking about the return of Christ, the great day of the Lord. And here's what he will do. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. In verse 6, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the father, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The Elijah message was never more needed than right now, today. And I know that your group is dedicated to blessing children, reaching out to families. So I want to give you a word of encouragement today. If you got the sheet that I passed around, I want to call your attention to some facts that are going on in our society. Absent fathers who fail to bless their children and be present in their life are at the root of most of the decay that we see in our society. Case in point, look at this. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts. 75% of adolescent patients in chemical abuse. 63% of all youth suicides, absent father homes. 80% of all rapists, 70% of juveniles in state institutions are from absent father homes. 85% of youth in prison from absent father homes. The list goes on. These are children that did not get their father's blessing. They didn't get the love of a father. And this is where it leads them. How many know, I don't care if you're a son or a daughter, when you get up to the age of puberty, there's a switch that goes and you start trying to see yourself through your father's eyes. And if the father isn't there, or the view that you get, or the reflection of you get, and his eyes is not positive and not good, you begin to internalize that. And it creates all kinds of things like rejection, anger, abandonment. And these are father wounds. And these father wounds are responsible for a lot of the things we see. Uh, those who are from a fatherless home are five times more likely to commit suicide. 32 times more likely to run away. Drop down. 71 of uh, teenage pregnancies are from girls from fatherless homes. And 92% of daughters who will divorce are from fatherless homes. This is at the root of much of the decay that's going on in America. But there's good news. God has an answer. There are five elements of a father's blessing. And uh, this comes uh, primarily from Genesis chapter 48. If you go back into the Hebrew foundations, you'll find that one of the things that God put in the society of, of his people was to know how to bless the children. But somehow that's been lost. And so according to um, what we see in the book of Genesis with Jacob and how Jacob uh, blessed his children, uh, there are five areas for the blessing. Now, I'm going to share it with you, and I'll come back to it. But I want you to just think with me for a moment. How did your dad, how did your father do in blessing you? And I want you to rate it on a scale from zero to ten and get real. Come on. Don't have to raise your hand or nothing. I'm just going to ask you in your mind to rate how your father did. Now, this comes right from the Bible. Meaningful touch of love and acceptance. How did your father do on a scale from 0 to 10? Okay. Number two, words of love and affirmation spoken. You know, some of us come from that John Wayne era. Gary Cooper, we don't talk about feelings. We don't share our emotions and we don't cry. We don't put up with those who do. Some of our dads came from that generation. Never told, never told their kids they loved them. So on a scale from zero to ten, how did your dad do in speaking love and affirmation to you? Number three, communicating a sense of high value to you on a scale from zero to ten. 
I've done this in many churches, and I promise you two-thirds of everybody there will fail the test. Number four, communicating a special future for your life on a scale from zero to ten. And lastly, a commitment to that special future on a scale from zero to ten. Now, why is this important? Come on now, how are you going to give the blessing if you don't have it? And this has got to be given to the men of today. We need to know how to bless the next generation, speak life to them, and encourage them. Because here's the good news. Even though your father may not have given you the blessing that he should have and didn't know how, there's still a father in heaven who knows how to bless and wants to restore us. And sometimes he'll use a godly man to come stand in the gap and to release the blessing and restore it. And I tell you, I've, I've prayed for men in their 90s and released to them before they died the Father's blessing because they didn't get it and they didn't know how to give it. I was a chaplain, a hospice chaplain for 20 years. I've been by the bedside of many men coming to the end of their journey. I've heard stories make your hair stand up. I'm going to share with you about one set story. And by the way, attached to this, on the back is the scale that I just went over and how to pray a father's blessing and how to pray a mother's blessing because as we've learned how to give the father's blessing, we discovered there are a lot of folks that didn't get blessed by their mother either. Mom was negative or not there uh, or hurtful and they didn't get the mother's love either. So I taught Marchie how to do that. So whenever we do this, I give the father's blessing, she gives the mother's blessing, and we see wholeness take place. My goodness. Hospice chaplain in California was not here. I got a call one time from the nurse, and she said, Chaplain, um, I got a daughter here that's distraught. She's crying. Her daddy has cancer of the throat, and uh, he's dying. He has a trach. He can't speak and she needs a chaplain. I said, oh, I'll be right over. So I went over and, and she said, uh, look chaplain, I'm just gonna be right up front with you. She said, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and I have forgiven my dad, but the other four kids won't come see him, they hate him. You see chaplain, he abused us in every way you could imagine. And they hate him, they just don't wanna see him. But I know chaplain, if they don't, they don't have some closure they're going to regret it. Is there anything we can do? I said, yes, there, there is. We can pray. How many know that prayer changes things? So we prayed, and the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. I said, was your, was your daddy in the army? Oh, yes, he was. He was in Korea. I see. So, um, all right. So I said, let's go and talk to him. Now, I was... Uh, I was a Marine for almost nine years. I brought my veterans hat. <laughs> you know what they say, what's a Marine? Always a Marine, right? <laughs> I'm also a Vietnam veteran. 17 years old, I was off the coast of Vietnam with one of those uh, Matty Mattel pop metal rifles called an M16. <laughs> They're not really a real rifle, you know. It's a jungle rifle. But uh, so I learned this. When you talk to military people, don't sugarcoat it. Don't patty cake it. Don't beat around the bush. Just two by four communication. Right? So I walked up to this man's bed and uh, I looked at him and I said, Bill, I'm your Marine chaplain. Come to do some truth speaking to you, sir. When you were in Korea in that foxhole, you said, God, if you'll spare my life, I'll serve you. And God honored that covenant that you made. He spared your life, but you didn't keep your part of the deal. Tears began to come down. I said, in fact, God not only honored his part of the deal, you got a grandson that's a minister. But God's not going to forsake you even now. Because he sent me. You were abused by your dad and rejected by your dad. You were hit by him and cursed by him. And you passed it on to your kids because you didn't know nothing else. You gave them what you got. 
That's called a generational curse. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, that it's passed on to the third and fourth generations if it is not broken. And sir, you're not leaving here until you get the blessing that your dad robbed you of and robbed your kids and grandkids of, and I'm here to give it. I stepped over to the bed and laid hands on this man and began to speak the Father's blessing. You know, the Father was there. When, at your date of your birth, he was there. He said, that's my beloved son, Billy. And every time you needed a dad that didn't show up, there was a Father in heaven that showed up who said, I'm here for you, son. You didn't know it, but he was there. He said, I'm always here. So I just prayed through this man's life. I, I broke off the curses. And at the end, I laid hands on him and said, Now, as a spiritual father, sir, I bless you. And I not only bless you, I bless the inheritance that's missing. Because here's the truth. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, it says we have a new inheritance through Christ to Abraham's seed. Amen. And that means when we come and we claim that inheritance, all the curses of the forefathers got to stop at the cross. Come on now, if there's cancer in your family, it's got to yield and stop at that cross. Amen. And come under the blood. If there's other things tracking your generations, like sugar diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. We teach about this stuff on disease, you know. It's a part of our healing room. Just a nugget for you. All autoimmune diseases work the same way. The white corpuscles in the body start attacking the body. And God didn't make them to do that. It happens because there's unforgiveness, roots of bitterness, stresses in the life that lodge themselves in that part of the body. And the white corpuscle immune system starts attacking what it's supposed to protect. Come on. God didn't make it that way. You bring the stuff to the cross, God will realign it and cause that immune system to start defending the body <clears throat> instead of tearing it down. So when I got done praying for this man, I'm noticing that the daughter's standing by the bedside and she's weeping. And I thought, she's never probably once heard her daddy say, I'm proud of you. I said, sir, do you want your kids to know that you want their forgiveness and you love them and you want them to be blessed? If you do, squeeze her hand. Squeezed her hand. She's just weeping. And I thought, no, she needs to hear something. Sir, would you permit me to speak what you can't speak over your daughter? And I just head up and down. So I stepped around, began to speak over the daughter, the father's blessing. Got a phone call sometime later from this daughter. She said, Chaplain, I want you to know what happened to that blessing. She said, it was like taking a pebble and dropping it in a pond, and you have ripples that go out. She said, uh, we had a family gathering, and I went to the oldest boy, John, six foot six, big hunk of a man, sitting there in the leather chair in the living room, and I told him what happened with the Father's blessing and how, how Daddy wanted us to be blessed and, and asked for forgiveness and that we didn't have to continue to live without the blessing. And Johnny slipped out of the leather chair and began to crawl across the room on his hands and feet, weeping. Uh, I need my daddy's blessing. Please. She said, Johnny, you have to understand it comes with Jesus. He's the one who restores all things, Johnny. You need Jesus too. All right, yes. Let him to Christ. She's a woman carrying the Father's blessing, and she released the Father's blessing. Then she went to every one of the other children and did the same thing. They all received Christ. She laid hands on them, received the Father's blessing. Then she gathered all the grandkids and said, Papa Bill left a blessing. And she blessed and broke that curse off of all the generations in her family line. I'll tell you today that the blessing of a father, the blessing of God defeats the curses of the enemy. You see what it says in, in Exodus chapter 20 that the iniquity um, 
of a man goes to the third and fourth generation, but the blessing goes to a thousand generations because a blessing is so much more powerful. Amen. So God, over the years, has anointed me to release the Father's blessing. And I, had a, I did have a hidden agenda when I came to Gary and I was up front with him about it. I'd want to bless your club and recognize them. And I want to impart to them the Father's blessing because they are ministering to children and they need to be part of the solution uh, here in our area and beyond to release the Father's blessing, the Father's heart, Amen. and to cover the children because a lot of them don't have fathers who bless them. Amen. So when you're at those gatherings of the, the motocross and other places and the kiddos are there, they may not know what you're doing, but God knows when you speak a blessing unto them and you speak life unto them, God honors it because you're representing Him. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to pray something for everybody here. And I want to ask you to do this. If your daddy didn't know how to love you and bless you, and you're needing this blessing, I'm going to have you walk your daddy to the cross. Biblical forgiveness is releasing others from the debt they owe you. Your daddy owed you a debt he didn't fulfill, but today you're going to release him from the debt. And number two, you give up your right to judge him no matter what he did. Not saying that it was okay, but you don't want to be the victim anymore. Amen. We're, we're going to just do this and you participate in whatever God wants you to participate in. And then we're going to, once we walk that through, we're going to ask, you know, the Holy Spirit gives us the opposite of the wounds. Did you know that for emotional woundedness, that the fruits, the wounds are all the opposite of the fruits? For example, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of being unwanted and unloved, fear of judgment and punishment, fear of death. The opposite of that is love, and it says perfect love casts out all fear, all fear. The opposite of peace is anxiety, anxious worry, and perfect peace will cast that out. The opposite of joy is sorrow, sadness, and depression, and the joy of the Lord will cast it out. So we not only walk stuff to the cross, but when we leave the, cro the cross, we go with the blessings of the fruits of the Spirit that heals our hearts. I'm going to pray now. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Some of us need to walk our dads to the cross. Some of us need to know how to love more completely. So whatever our need today, we need you. We need to understand the height and depth and breadth of your love and how to release it to this next generation. So Father, right now, let your Holy Spirit come and help us. I want you to see yourself with your dad at that cross and just tell Christ, I release him. I give up my right to judge him. I don't want what he gave that hurt me anymore. I receive your love, Father, the perfect love that cast out fear of abandonment, fear of betrayal, fear of rejection. Fear of being unwanted and unloved. I give it all to you, God. Anger that may have been in the house. Lord, take all that and give me the perfect peace. Take the anxiety. Worry. Heavenly Father, I want the joy of the Lord. Take sorrow and sadness from my past. And let joy cast it out. Give me goodness. Meekness, patience, self-control. Father, as we're gathered here before you, as a spiritual father and a dad, I release a blessing to everyone here 
that they'll carry that anointing of the Father's blessing and be able to release it to restore others to their inheritance. I release that inheritance upon your life, a completeness and a fullness of God's provision and plans for your life that you'll walk in that inheritance that goes all the way back to Abraham. And I speak a breaking of every generational curse today. And I release the blessing of God's marvelous love through the blood of Christ that you are redeemed, you are cleansed, you are activated to fulfill every assignment that God has in your life. And I bless you to move forward in it today in Christ's name. Oh, Father, thank you for restoring the blessing where it's been missing, healing the hearts that are here, and activating us fully, Father, to be a part of the solution to affect society today where there are so many youth, so many children, and even adults who are wounded and need a blessing to restore their hearts. Use us as the answer, I pray. I thank you now for being with us and going before us. We pray in Christ Yeshua's name. Everyone here and their families receive that blessing. In his holy name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Awesome what God is using you to do. I, I was marveling, you know, as I was watching the film today, how God is taking this ministry and sharing the gospel around the world. 192 of the 196 nations, God give them the, the, the last four, give it to them. The gospel will go to every nation, every tribe and every tongue. And then shall the end come, that's what the Bible says. Amen. You know, those of you that are former military, God needs spiritual warriors. And the church needs the stuff that we learned about warfare. For example, don't go take a mountain unless you've got a plan to keep it. What's your battle plan? What are your weapons? What's the enemy's capabilities? And what are you going to do to counter those and take them out? Look, the church needs to start thinking in these terms. And those of us who've had that kind of training, really, we are able to do warfare that the common person who isn't trained doesn't know about. So I challenge you, if you're a veteran, get active in spiritual warfare. Take the enemy's territory back from it. And let the church get out there to set the captives free. I'm going to end with this. Christ gave a mission statement, and his mission statement is found in Luke 4.18. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The anointing of God is upon me to preach good news to the poor. Better translation would be the afflicted. To heal those who are brokenhearted. To set the oppressed free. To open blind eyes and prison doors and declare the year of Jubilee. You notice how all of that is outward focused? A lot of churches get stuck in looking inward. But everything he said about his mission statement was go out and reach the broken and the hurting and those who need to know the good news. That's what you all are doing. But the churches need to get this. That's our mission statement. What are we doing with it? Well, you guys are an example. You're like a poster child of that. You're out there meeting people where they're at and their needs and the children. But the rest of us need to get that and to catch that. May God bless us with the grace to, to capture that kind of vision in Brownwood and beyond. We're the, we're, I believe this. God, you know why I'm here in Brownwood? God showed me that revival is coming out of Brownwood. I was passing through Texas, and I read a magazine. It was, it was talking about the Civil War. It said in the Civil War, <clears throat> somebody's going to go pick up the beef. <laughs> I think they're on the way to get it. Um, during the Civil War, Texas was involved, as you know, with the Confederacy. And when those men came home from that, their farms were gone, the, the finances were devastated, the families were broken, In many cases the farms were burned down. The, the whole economy here was just shot. But God had done a miracle, I think because some of the people left behind were praying. And they found that there were six million of these crazy looking longhorn steers that rose up. And they rounded those things up and drove them across the Red River into Kansas and Oklahoma. It went to the 14 states around Texas. 
and it brought economic revival and renewal to the heart of America. And God says, I'm going to do it again. It's coming out of Texas again. Like a great tree with a trunk and its branches reaching to those 14 states through the Red River, the blood of Christ, I'm going to bring restoration and renewal and revival to America, and it's coming out of Texas. And this is the heart of Texas right here. So I moved here. I didn't bring a handout, but I'll give it to Gary. Coming up on September 18th, which is the Day of Atonement, we're calling for a national day of repentance. It's time. And we're going to call for America to repent. And we've got several organizations like National Day of Prayer that are behind it. And I believe God's going to restore America. But it's time. You know, what does it say in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people who are called by my name, that's no denomination, that's those who are called by his name, will humble themselves and recognize that they need the rest of them and come together before my face, and turn from their wicked ways and their history. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and heal America. Heal the land. That's the promise. We have an opportunity to see that begin this fall. And it's coming out of Texas. Pray for us as we help give leadership to that. But I believe that there's a real need for prayer warriors right now. And since Texas is being called, um, to, to trumpet this thing, we need some prayer warriors that aren't afraid to stand up in Texas. God will cause them to rise up. Maybe some of y'all are part of that. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you and your families and this ministry and give you his shalom, his peace. In Christ Yeshua's name, amen. All right, now we're going to have uh, um, iced tea.